So what I was going to talk about is um, the PFAS method history, a sample overview of the new method OTM45, um, similarities of 45 to method 10, key differences, sample fractions, volatile model of PFAS sample approach, and some tripwires to watch out for for OTM45 field sample. So driven by the focus on PFAS, I'm sure you've heard about how, how uh, prevalent it is today. I mean, you, boy, you hear everything about all the contamination and everything that's being developed, that's happening out there with the firefighting foam and, and stuff. In fact, that one, there was a big accident up in New York and they were spraying this foam all over the place. And I'm like, is that, is that got PFAS in it? I don't know. Um, but there was, uh, a lot of testing that started to have to happen back two, three years ago because people got concerned. They're like, where is this PFAS coming from from a process perspective? So they started, you know, doing you know, testing, and but there wasn't a test method. EPA didn't have a test method for it. So people were just kind of going by what laboratories told them to do when they were to kind of, you know, looking at different things from a um, you know, chemical perspective, what can we use it in pingers to capture this, and a lot of different methods out there being used. Now, the EPA recognized this, so they said, well, we better uh, come up with a standardized approach, you know, so that we get, we get consistent quality data. So in the late fourth quarter 2020, they came up with uh, OTM 45, which is a non-volatile PFAS method. So they came up with some different uh, some considerations for the method. They said, well, you know, PFAS semi-volatile is particulate in nature. So they, they said, well, we, we're going to need an isokinetic method five type approach. The sample traverse uh, will be required because of the particulate nature of the compound. PFAS exists in various phases. So therefore, we're going to need a sample train where we can collect different fractions. And that it was sounded a lot like a modified method five train. So the EPA method SW846 method 10 sample procedure satisfies these criteria and that was a good starting point for this. So they took this method 010 train and incorporated a lot of its similarities into the new OTM45. You know, they both have a they're both isokinetic sample methods, of course. They have a sample volume target of three meters, uh, three cubic meters. Uh, they use XAD uh, trap media. They have different sample train fraction analyses, and uh, they have comparable QA, QC as well. Uh, the rinse, there are some differences, though. There, there's the, the solvent rinse is, is polar and basic instead of the acetone that's in the methylene chloride used in the the 010 train. Uh, the filter box and probe, they're run cooler than method five. We'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, there's several additional sample fractions recovered. There's a breakthrough XAD trap added. And then there, there's two blank trains uh, instead of the one for 010. So these are the seven fractions conductor or collected from the sample train. You can see here, there's the, the probe and front half of the filter holder. There's a particulate filter. There's a back half of that filter and the condenser. The XAD trap, impinger condensate solution. There's the impinger uh, rinse, and then there's a backup trap. Those seven fractions are combined into these four. Front half composite, back half composite, condensate, impinger contents, and then the, the breakthrough trap being number four. So I don't know if you've ever seen a, a source testing train or not, but here's what it kind of looks like. You've got the, the stack, and then you have a pitot tube here an S-type pitot tube that gets your differential pressure reading and that gives you your velocity. And then you have your sample, this is the, the PFAS sample train itself. You've got a sample nozzle here, probe. Here's the, the filter, so that, that's fraction one that I just talked about. 
Then the gas is cooled in this condenser. And then it, then it enters the first XAD trap. That's sample fraction two. Then it goes into the impingers that has that methanol solution. That's three, and then the backup trap is four. And all this is controlled by a, uh, a metering council that has a critical or a pump and dry gas meter like. So there's also a volatile PFAS sample method, and that's uh, comprised of, for, for the PFAS compounds that are at a boiling point less than 100 degrees C is, is, is the, uh, the target that, or the threshold that's used. Some of those are listed here. Um, given the gaseous nature, there's no need for isokinetic sampling. A single point non-isokinetic approach is used, method 18 type. A low flow rate of 0.2 liters per minute. Methanol is used as, as the absorbing solution, and the, the impingers are completely immersed in a dry ice bath. Got a schematic of that one here. And as you can see, let me get this working. Again, you've got the, the stack, but now you've got just a, a single point probe. It kind of shows a nozzle on there, but that's really not what needed. That's just a just just an opening is all that's, that'll suffice, and that goes through the the heated probe into a series of impingers that have the uh, the methanol in them, and as you can see, they're completely immersed in a, in a dry ice bath, and that's especially important to keep those those as chilled as possible because the reason they have so many of these impingers is they're typically analyzed separately. So you can evaluate breakthrough, which which happens very easily in the sample train. So that uh, if they if they get too warm, you'll analyze and pinger six and, and then see some hits there indicating that you've lost some of your sample. So as I mentioned, it's important to keep the impingers completely submerged. Uh, the maximum flow rate is really 0.2 liters per minute. Uh, the higher sample rate, anything higher than that risks sample breakthrough. And to use a shortened stem in the first impinger is, is, a, is a good trick to prevent freeze up of, of any collected condensate. So some key sampling points are listed here. I won't go through them all in, in any de great detail, but um, obviously PFAS is not your typical source test program. Uh, so proper PFAS planning. Project planning is, is critical. It's important to use experienced test crews. You'll fully understand your source and then some of the key parameters associated with it. Um, you know, it's highly toxic, so you have to adhere to H&S procedures with facility personnel early on. Communicate um, all of these different practices. The lab selection is critical. There's only a few now that, that have any PFAS experience at all. So um, Eurofins is probably the, the, the best. Then there's SGS and some others, but still pretty, pretty new. Pretty uh, people are, are, are trying to catch up, but uh, there's a strong need for field sampling and coordination because of all these factors. It's important to watch the sample train temperatures very carefully because you don't want to change the state of, of the PFAS material. Ensure a clean, a secure, and contaminant-free recovery area because that's something that's, uh, you know, contamination is, is very possible. Sample IDs, we'll talk about that in a minute because you have a lot of uh, sample train fractions, um, blank issues. The algae sample containers only. You know, we don't, don't don't use glass. You know, with, with Teflon um, caps. Yeah, that's it's it's primarily because of the Teflon caps. You know, required for the other types of bottles. I mean, you know, glass wouldn't be an issue, but um, it's the sealing mechanism. Okay, but, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly, yeah. Fractions are chilled, and then, um, you know, here's some of the uh, 
you know, like we just talked about the, the tough online, you know, caps and tapes, and, you know, even the blue ice the post it notes even, you know, have some, have some PFAS in them. So this is how, this is tough to read, but I just wanted to, you know, on these last slides, just to kind of show you the kind of documentation that's required, you know, for such a complex test program. On this slide, you've got all the different sample fractions. Um, you know, from the front half particulate filter through the resin tube, through the impingers, you know, complete with their sample IDs and the analytical parameters, the type of sample container and, and the lab where it's going to. And this one has the uh, particulate uh, or more detail on the analytical side for the lab. You know, it tells them, you know, what type of analysis, the, you know, is you know, the spikes, samples, um, you know, et cetera, you know, what, what, what the details of the anal on the analytical side for each of the sample fractions. So. I'm sorry. Any, anybody that's involved in the, in the Teflon manufacturer, you know, of any, of any, you know, PFAS itself is, um, It's basically a string of, of carbon and fluorine atoms, and um, which is very difficult to break, by the way. This bond between the, the chlorine and the fluoride ion is very, very tough to break. So um, a lot of the control people are struggling with how to actually treat it, you know, which is another issue. But. Actually, both. You know, even folks like, um, you know, municipal or, or sewage sludge incinerators are dealing with it because it's in their waste streams. You know, it, it's it's in their waste, and so now it's in their waste water, and it's also potentially in their their uh, control device exhaust also. So, um, yeah, we we probably do more PFAS testing at at the end user or, or the disposal site. Than actually the, the initial uh, product. Uh, 